Welcome to season two of Task and Gear. For our premiere, we're kicking off mechanized infantry week. It's like our version of Shark Week, but all about mobilized, dismounted infantry and their victor. Today's episode is about the next generation infantry fighting vehicle, and it will be the new replacement for the M2 Bradley, possibly even the eight-wheeled striker. We're talking about the ground combat vehicle which is how you're supposed to say it. I wanna know all about the new specifications, armament, and the types of tactics they employ at the company level. Does this program make any sense or is it going to turn out like the universal camel pattern program? The ground combat vehicle prototype weighed in at 53 tons, which is twice the weight of the Bradley, but it's capable of carrying a whole squad of nine dismounted troops. If you've ever spent 12 hours riding around in the back of a vehicle stuffed in with nine other soldiers, then you'd wish the army would have the decency to invent a vehicle that only had room for one. The ground combat vehicle program has gone through so many ups and downs where it changed its name and has been canceled several times, once in 2009, then again in 2014, and now it's resurfacing under the name Optionally Manned Fighting Vehicle. Personally, I think it's 100% necessary that we replace the old Bradleys. I also think this is probably the Army's last chance with the patience of Congress since they failed twice already. A short summary of what the OMFV will have is added ability to engage targets high in the sky or low down below the ground. So for instance, I would no longer be safe deep down in my dad's basement where I currently live. In the past, the turret system of the Bradley was never designed to engage at those angles because they didn't consider those possibilities with their stubborn Cold War style of thinking. I say that like I would have designed it any better. The new vehicle will pack a way harder punch with a 50 millimeter or possibly a 40 millimeter autocannon instead of the 25 millimeter that the Bradley had. Wait. I'm not sure if you're fully grasping what that means. We're talking about a massive 50 millimeter size autocannon. I don't think they make body armor for that yet in case you're needing an upgrade. We're gonna go into that more later about the new types of ammo and how the 50 millimeter is gonna work. It'll be able to carry a fully loaded squad of nine soldiers, which is a huge change if you think about what that means for doctrine. No more having to split up a squad between different vehicles because the Bradley could only carry five or six dismounted soldiers. Today's episode is sponsored by Purdue Cybersecurity Apprenticeship Program. It's an online certificate and degree program offered by Purdue University. They immerse students at all levels in real-world apprenticeship jobs, and it also allows employers to fund their education. That's right, you won't need to take out a loan or use your GI Bill. With an estimated 3.5 million jobs predicted by 2021, it's a safe bet for anyone looking for a career change. Click the link in the description below, fill in your information, and check it out for yourself. The armor shielding will be stronger and more resistant to IEDs, shape charges as well, thanks to the double V shaped hull. Double V sounds fancy, but basically it means they thought to shape the underbelly so that it deflects the blast from an IED better than a flat surface. If you think that's obvious now, go ahead and give yourself a big pat on the back for having hindsight. One of the coolest features which the OMFV will implement is the Trophy Active Protection System. It detects incoming RPGs and missiles, and then it dynamically calculates their flight path and shoots them down in midair. We'll need to be able to run in a brand new proposed silent mode, so the crew can still operate it without running the engines. Not many people consider how loud these things are, especially when you're in a rural enemy village at 3 a.m. That's when a platoon of these sound exactly like an oncoming train. The Department of Defense is making a major change to how it approaches acquiring new firearms and vehicles. You're really gonna wanna know about this because I've heard them quietly changing the way they do things, and it's all pointing in this one direction now. In the past, they would set very strict government-mandated technical requirements. To give you an idea, in the last two failed attempts by the Army, they actually had a list of 200 must-haves for no room for trade-off or compromise. No compromise, yeah. That's how you get something done, big army. Compromise with no one. I'm glad the army's now having to eat a big slice of humble pie and basically accept whatever the contractor gives them. It turns out when you have a focus group of brass trying to drive innovation, you end up with a bloated, expensive example of government waste like the old versions of the ground combat vehicle. The old one looked like it ate a Bradley and an Abrams and ended up weighing literally 84 tons by the time it was canceled by Congress in 2013. The budget office had to come in and be like, enough is enough. I'm not one of those guys that thinks less is more, more is usually more, but in this case, you went too far, Army, and now you're having to live with the consequences and rein in that spending. 
they've given private industry nine characteristics that they need to achieve while the army leaves it completely up to the professional defense industry innovators to do what they do best and achieve those nine different goals and we'll go into those in a minute basically the army is changing from their normal mo here by asking the defense industry for their input on how to make the best vehicles if you've ever seen the movie pentagon wars about a group of generals and their nightmare to create the bradley you'll understand why this approach represents a revolution in acquiring future weapons the Army asking for outside input and feedback is like the equivalent of an officer apologizing to an enlisted man for making him wait at the motor pool for like six hours for no reason. That happens never. Make no mistake, the only reason the Army's finally doing this is because the last time they tried to develop the vehicle, they only got one bid response to create a prototype. All the other contractors didn't want to touch that thing with a 30-foot pole. And this is because they tried to force the contractors to make it their way. The one bid that did get sent in, it ended up being disqualified by the army because it didn't meet its strict requirements. The army only got one response and they said no to them. Listen, the army here has two strikes on them. The last few attempts to replace the Bradley failed spectacularly and expensively. So they have a ton of eyes from Congress looking at them this time very closely. The army actually seemed like they got their feelings hurt last time and they issued a survey to the defense industry asking them, what did we do wrong? They basically texted their ex-girlfriend at midnight being like, why don't you ever call me back? Sometimes the army can be very relatable. If you're wondering when we might see this new optionally manned fighting vehicle, we learned from a great article written by Joseph Tristeznik at the war zone that the army plans to buy 14 prototypes by this year. They plan to have the first entire brigade of these new OMFVs by the end of 2028, according to the article by the Army. If you like Mechanized Infantry Week, the Shark Week equivalent for military channels, please consider hitting the like button, subscribing. It helps support our channel and promotes our videos on YouTube. So I did you a kindness here without you even asking. So no need to thank me, but I went ahead and read the Army Congressional Report for acquiring the OMFV program. And I got all this interesting information. And I left out the boring stuff. Some interesting things to note where they included the main reason why the army thought the past replacement programs failed. Number one, they relied too much on immature technologies like sensors, which were supposed to allow them to engage the enemy without a line of sight. This is too good to be true technology and it proved to be a failure. They frequently changed requirements which ballooned the cost of the program. They mentioned a few times the program management in the past was done poorly, where they probably had unqualified high ranking officers who never spent a day in their entire career in a mechanized infantry unit, changing the goalposts constantly because they didn't want to end up with some crappy vehicle and it'd be their fault. So I have some respect for them here because they are actually being honest here about why they messed up the last two times. This kind of self-criticism has actually always been a part of the military culture. The idea here is that when you have some kind of failure somewhere, you do an after action report to honestly identify why things didn't work out, and how you can avoid that in the future. Instead of the ending the mission and pointing fingers like we sometimes see in the civilian world, the military actually takes a constructive approach to improvement. Another interesting thing from the document was that in order to successfully replace the M2 Bradley, the Army is planning to use expertise from industry experts and academia. That tells you how completely backwards they had it in the past. They needed to specifically remind themselves to listen to experts. The Army wants to experiment with the prototypes and run demonstrations for criticism by the line troops. If you're interested in how the Army acquires technology, hearing this should be a huge relief, especially when we know historically how dense brass can be when it comes to getting new toys. I can just picture that last general in charge of the last program that failed, reading a bunch of Tom Clancy novels at a Washington DC Starbucks. God, if you don't believe they will actually follow through with this philosophy, the only good news I have for you is that it's exactly how they're developing the next generation M4 replacement rifle. It seems like the military is actually trying to change here, although I've had my heart broken before. Talking about all the cutting edge new tech mixed with traditional tactics reminded me of the Purdue Cybersecurity Apprenticeship Program. By signing up, you earn industry recognized certificates or graduate with an associate degree in IT or a bachelor's in computer and information science majoring in cybersecurity. There's also an option to earn a master's in cybersecurity and trusted systems. Again, it's no cost to you. So click the link below in the description to sign up and learn how to get started. The nine different key characteristics are survivability, lethality, mobility, weight, 
logistics, transportation, growth, manned, and training. And we're gonna talk about what's new here. With lethality, the OMFV is going to get a badass upgrade because the Army might be giving it the 50mm XM913 Bushmaster Automatic Cannon. This weapon is engineered by Northrop Grumman and its advanced fire control system lets the vehicle fire while moving and its sensors automatically adjust fire at a distance. It's the next generation ammo, which is linkless. The linkless ammo allows them to adjust their rate of fire to 200 rounds per minute or as fast as 600 rounds per minute. They also have an explosive effect on target unlike anything we've seen before. It's called a chain gun because the rounds are fed by a DC motor which drives the chain that feeds the ammo into the weapon. In some cases it has a dual feed system from the right and the left which allows the gunner to choose between armor piercing and high explosive rounds. The weight of the 50mm system is an additional 500 pounds at least. The main idea with this weapon system is that it can hit targets out to 4,000 meters and beyond. Other near-peer countries have weapon systems which can hit that far, so we can't allow a situation where our vehicles are outgunned. The Army sounds like they're getting tricked into waiting for a too-good-to-be-true system here again. There's a company named Olsen which is working on an airburst ammo and GPS-guided 50mm ammo which would make small course adjustments to the target. This could potentially extend the range out to six kilometers, but the technology, even though it sounds amazing, isn't at a point yet where it reliably works. This is exactly the kind of thing that was noted in the OMFV congressional report on why past programs failed. The Army sees a new, shining, amazing technology that's almost ready, and they start dumping money into it only to find out they've been sold a lemon. I'm not saying that that system's a lemon, I'm just saying that it potentially could be. Since every rideshare app and every person named Elon Musk is interested in autonomous driving, the Army also wants to make sure that they have this function too. It sounds simple, but this would be a power intense system, meaning it will need to draw a lot of electrical current from other possible systems. It could also potentially free up more infantry soldiers because right now one person from every squad has to be designated as the driver crew role. If that role could be automated, then the soldier could be added to the dismounted firepower. The other guidelines like mobility, weight, logistics, and transportation are all going to be difficult engineering solutions for the competitors to weigh trade-offs in. Maintenance logistics issues can quickly start to add up and hurt the readiness of a brigade. With the next-gen vehicle, the Army wants the high-tech AI system to have the ability to do predictive maintenance. They hoped that the striker would do that, but it never really actually worked. Keeping the maintenance more simple also makes you less likely to be slamming your Kevlar against the pavement wondering why this multi-million dollar piece of shit won't work. One of the other requirements for the vehicle is called growth, and this characteristic is just an army code word for modular. Normally I laugh at how obsessed the military is with being modular, but here it actually makes a ton of sense. The army's thinking ahead here knowing that whatever vehicle they go with, they're going to be stuck with for the next 50 years, so it needs to have the potential room for expansion. Mainly, this means the power supply and engine need to be strong enough to support more weight and more power consumption than it currently uses. According to the congressional report on the OMFV, there were some Bradley units overseas that actually had to turn off some components so they could run their counter IED electronic jamming systems. You don't want to be in a situation where you can't run the radio and run the counter IED systems. If I'm in the back seat of a next generation OMFV, I want to be able to put the radio on while we roll up on the objective and blast Dojo Cat at the enemy.